In this lesson, we'll examine the early stages of visual processing, and along the way, we'll add to our uh, list of conceptual tools to understand neurons and how they can represent things in the world. So here we have the human brain, and we see the person's eye here, and of course, light will enter the eye and strike the back of the eye, the retina. We can think of the retina as a two-dimensional sheet of light-sensitive cells. And the way they're uh, hooked up here, there are axons leaving the eye. We call this the optic nerve. So uh, when retinal cells detect light, electrical signals in the form of action potentials will race down the axons of these uh, optic nerves uh, to a structure in the brain called the thalamus. Now, this is the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Don't worry about that name for now. But just uh, uh, it's enough to know that there's a synapse here. And then cells in the thalamus are going to send their axons, and that's this whole mass of fibers here. Those axons project up to the visual cortex, in particular V1 here. You'll notice there are different areas of, of uh, visual cortex, but V1 gets the principal input from the thalamus. So this is the flow of visual information in the brain, from the retina down the optic nerve to the thalamus. From the thalamus cells, they send their signals back to the visual cortex. To see what this visual pathway looks like in a real brain, here we have a brain that's been turned upside down. The front of the brain is over here, and the back of the brain is over here. And some of the temporal lobes have been dissected away so that we can see some of the nerves. So up here we have the remains of the optic nerve. So the optic nerve would extend out this way to the eyeball. The eyeball's been removed, and this optic nerve would go to the other eye. Uh, but here we have the optic nerves progressing to the thalamus, so on both sides. Now, uh, thalamus cells then send their axons, and that's what this whole bundle of white matter, these are the axons uh, from thalamus cells. So there's a massive projection of axons back to visual cortex. So uh, lots of the tissue has been dissected away, so you can actually see this is visual cortex, and it is uh, hooked up to the thalamus, which is getting its information from the eyes. So this is the, the uh, visual pathway in the human brain. Now what you're about to uh, see is a famous experiment done some decades ago where researchers recorded the electrical activity of cells in the visual cortex in an awake animal while that animal was looking at various stimuli on a screen. So they wanted to measure the electrical activity of individual cells back here in the visual cortex while the animal was looking at visual stimuli. And the experimental setup looks like this. So here we have the animal, in this case a cat, and it's been sedated, so it's, it's comfortable, but it's, uh, it's immobile here. It's in an apparatus so that it is just uh, eyes open, but eyes fixed on a screen, and then they're going to project different stimuli on the screen. Meanwhile, they're inserting microelectrodes into the back part of the brain, the visual cortex, and they're finding individual cells, and then they're recording the frequency of action potentials for various stimuli that they show the animal. Okay, so as this diagram illustrates here, you see the, the cat is looking at a bar of light, or you can think of this as an edge at a certain orientation. And what Hubel and Wiesel discovered, uh, somewhat by accident really, uh, is that there were populations of cells in the visual cortex that seemed to prefer certain edges of different orientations. And remember, we talked about a preferred stimulus. The preferred stimulus is that stimulus that generates the maximum action potential frequency in the target cell. So what they're uh, showing over here is the cell's preferred stimulus. So when they would shine a horizontal bar, right, for a horizontal edge, uh, the, um, and this is time on the x-axis, the cell did not respond with any action potentials. If the edge was at a slight angle, still no response. As the edge sort of uh, continued towards the vertical, you get an increasing level of response. So high frequency action potentials for a vertical edge or a vertical bar of light. And again, as you continue to rotate the stimulus, you get decreasing response. So what they found was that th this cell, this particular cell, one cell, had a preferred stimulus of a vertical edge or a vertical bar of light.
Now, when they would push their electrode through the visual cortex to just record from other types of cells, they found cells that responded to all of these different kinds of uh, stimuli. In other words, different cells had different preferred stimuli, but they all were responding to edges of one orientation or another. And so they sometimes are called orientation cells or edge detectors. So over here we have all these little colored marks. Um, we can think of these as just sort of uh, edges, the, the different kinds of edges of, of all the different types of orientations you could imagine. <coughs> and, and the idea is there are populations of cells in, in groups that respond to all these different kinds of orientations, creating a map in the visual cortex of cells that are prepared to respond to edges of different orientations. Now, why are edges so important? Well, after all, objects in our environment have boundaries that are edges, right? Tables and chairs and buildings and TVs and so on. Um, these objects, the, the boundaries of these objects are, are lines of various orientations. Even curves can be sort of broken down into uh, smaller line segments of, of different orientations. So what these researchers uh, discovered was that the earliest stages of visual processing uh, seemed to uh, break the visual world down into uh, edges of various orientations and it, it raised the possibility that perhaps later in the visual processing um, more complicated uh, types of uh, objects and shapes are being processed but the earliest stages of visual processing seems to involve the detection of edges of different orientations now, to understand why a particular cell might respond to a particular edge, uh, in this case a vertical edge, we have to do some, some background. And uh, we have to know something about how the retina is hooked up to the visual cortex. So here we're going to see uh, the two-dimensional sheet of the retina. And uh, the region of the retina that has the highest density of, uh, of cone cells is called the fovea. And so when you're looking at something and, you know, and focusing on that object, the light from the object is, it hits the fovea portion of the retina. And so then uh, other objects in the periphery would be striking uh, locations on the retina in the peripheral region of the retina. But as it turns out, um, the light hitting the fovea is sent to a, a certain particular region of the visual cortex. And so light striking the peripheral part of the retina is processed by a spatially distinct region of the visual cortex. So in a sense, we want to think of the visual cortex as a map of the retina. There is a, a, uh, a mapping, a spatial mapping that is preserved between the retina and the cortex. The thalamus is the sort of uh, the way station there. So to reiterate, there is a, a, you can think of it as kind of a one-to-one -one spatial mapping uh, between the retina and the cortex. And this is going to uh, allow us to begin to understand how uh, the wiring pattern between the retina and the cortex might set up uh, cells that respond preferentially to uh, edges of different orientations. But first, let's, uh, let's continue to really nail down what we mean by this mapping here. Let's take a look at this diagram. Now imagine uh, I ask you here to focus on the, um, on the X here. Now whatever it is we're looking at, that, uh, uh, the light from that object is striking the fovea portion of our retina. But notice as you look at the X here, you can still kind of see the triangle over here and the square over here, right? The, that would be in your peripheral vision. So you have retinal cells that are processing these other objects, but your, your focus is on the X. Now if we come down here to this part of the diagram, then the stimulus at the fovea is processed by a certain part of the uh, visual cortex, and uh, objects that are uh, detected by the peripheral part of the retina are therefore processed by spatially distinct regions. And so here again, we see this idea of a, of a spatial mapping of the visual cortex uh, that is kind of has a one-to-one -one relationship with the two-dimensional layout of the retina. Okay, now there's one more thing we need to uh, remind ourselves before we, we uh, try to understand how uh, orientation cells or edge detectors uh, exist in the visual cortex. We have to remind ourselves how about how target cells respond to their inputs. So up here we have a target cell and it's got three inputs. So there are three synapses shown here. But in the diagram, only this synapse is shown to be active. So transmitters being released, channels being opened, sodium rushing in. But because there's only one synapse active here, we may not reach threshold. And so the uh, um, 
neuron, the target neuron does not respond. The channels, remember those important channels right at the base of the axon here, they stay closed. They stay closed, there's no action potential generated. So the target cell does not respond even though one of its inputs is active. The story is different down here. Here we see all three of this, the uh, terminals are active simultaneously, which means transmitters uh, coming out of all three terminals, channels are being opened up at the three synapse locations, sodium rushing in. We pass threshold. The important sodium and potassium channels down here open up in the domino fashion, and we get an action potential. So when the target cell passes threshold, it responds. Notice then the obvious difference between the two situations is uh, down here in the bottom we have simultaneous activity of the inputs. The target cell uh, responds when it, uh, it, it is driven past threshold by that simultaneous activity. Now we're going to call that principle spatial summation because three spatially separated synapses when simultaneously activated can activate the target cell, can get it past threshold. And notice then the maximum frequency of action potentials uh, will be generated when all three inputs are simultaneously active. If some subset of inputs are active, you get a lower response. In fact, no response if only one of the inputs is, is, uh, is active. Okay, so with the concept of spatial summation, and this idea that the, the retina and the cortex have a kind of a one-to-one -one mapping relationship, now we're ready to see how we might understand edge detectors. Okay, so now, in this diagram up top here, we have the two-dimensional retina. And let's say we've got some cortical cells in the, in the visual cortex here that have a preserved spatial mapping with cells on the retina, right? So, for example, if a spot of light hits the retina at this spatial location, then this visual cortex cell will respond, but this one will not and this one will not. And so the idea then is, is uh, this cell responds with action potentials, transmitters relief, released, but since only one of the inputs is activated here, the target cell may not respond. So we'll say no response here. But notice what happens if we shine two spots of light, one right next to each other. Now we're going to activate the two uh, visual cortical cells. Right, remember there's a spatial uh, uh, relation between the visual cortex cells and the retina. So in this case, we get two of the inputs are activated and we might just reach threshold uh, so the target cell generates low frequency action potential response. Now you can probably see what's going to happen here. Right, we go from one spot of light two spots of light that are starting to look like an edge, right? If we added a third spot of light over here, we would have the equivalent of a kind of a line, a horizontal line or a horizontal edge. So let's take a look. So up top then here, we've got three spots of light arranged in that orientation, a horizontal orientation, and that's sufficient to activate the three cortical cells because of that spatially preserved relationship. Uh, since all inputs are activated, we get maximum response here, high frequency action potentials in the target cell. Notice if we take our pattern of light activation of the retina and arrange that pattern to be a vertical line of spots of lights, notice the, this cell here will not be activated, this cell here will not be activated, only the middle cell will be activated. And again, when only one of the three inputs is active, we said that was not sufficient to pass threshold, so we get no response. So the target cell does not respond to a vertical edge. It's responding to a horizontal edge. What about an edge with a just a slight angle with the horizontal? Well, here the idea is the middle cell will be active, definitely strongly active, but the, the, the neighboring cells here, they might be a little bit active because the, the light at that region of the retina might activate a little bit uh, of these uh, two uh, neighboring cells. And so with a little bit of activity, we might just get a response here. And so in this way, uh, a bar of light that is close to vertical will produce a lower response, but nevertheless a response, but the maximum response is the, the, uh, the horizontal bar. So a, a bar that is near the preferred stimulus generates a lower response, but the 
preferred stimulus is the stimulus that generates the maximum response. So in this case, we're going to think of this target cell as representing the presence of the preferred stimulus. This is an important concept here. The target cell's activity represents the presence of the preferred stimulus, which in this case is a horizontal edge at that location on the retina. So we define the preferred stimulus as that stimulus that generates maximum response in the target cell, but now we can think of the relationship in the reverse and say that activity of the target cell represents the presence of the preferred stimulus out in the world. And this gets to this idea that, that lots of uh, brain scientists think of the brain as representing, as a representational system, that activity of brain cells represents other things, in this case, some stimulus in the world. Now, in this diagram, I've, I've, I've put together sort of a wiring diagram, how we might think of the two-dimensional retina is hooked up in a one-to-one -one mapping with cells in the thalamus. And then cells in the thalamus are going to send their axons to visual cortex cells, the red ones here. And here we have the two big green cells, and these will be our orientation cells. Now, the idea is, um, given what we know about spatial summation, we should be able to figure out which of these orientation cells responds to the two stimuli shown here. So we have a vertical line and a diagonal line. So one of these cells responds to a vertical uh, line on the retina, and one of the cells responds to the diagonal line on the retina. There are two ways to approach this, to figure this out. You could work backwards from the orientation cell towards the retina, or you could work forwards from the retina towards the uh, orientation cell. Let me show you how it works if you go forward, and then I'll do backwards. So forward, let's take the uh, visual, the vertical line. So a vertical line projected on the retina is going to activate these retinal cells in a row here, so these three retinal cells. So now what we want to do is just follow the um, information as it proceeds up to the visual cortex. So this uh, retinal cell is going to um, send uh, uh, action potentials to this thalamus cell. The middle one here will activate this thalamus cell, and the bottom one here will activate this thalamus cell. So now we want to follow those axons up to the visual cortex. So this one goes here and ends up synapsing on this one. This one goes here, ends up synapsing here and there. But notice we've got now two synapses on this cell down here. And then this cell synapses on the red one here, but that synapses again on the bottom green cell. So this bottom cell is the cell that will be activated if we shine a vertical bar of light on the retina. This is going to be our vertical edge detector right here. And you can check and see for yourself uh, that the other cell then is going to be the, the diagonal if you proceed forward through the system. But now let me do this cell going backwards. This cell is going to be maximally active when all three of its inputs are simultaneously active. Remember, we said that that was spatial summation. And that's what's going to drive this cell um, past its threshold the most, is when all of its inputs are simultaneously active. So now what we can do is just follow the uh, inputs backward and see what pattern on the retina that represents. So going backward to this cell, that cell activates the thalamus cell down here, and it looks like that thalamus cell gets its uh, input from this uh, retinal uh, cell here. This pathway goes back to the middle red cell, to the middle thalamus cell, to the middle retinal cell. This pathway here goes to this red cell, up to that thalamus cell, to the top left um, retinal cell. And so that would suggest that a diagonal line projected on the retina would send signals forward that would converge on this cortical cell. So this is our diagonal cell. Uh, our diagonal orientation cell, or our diagonal edge detector. So after Hubel and Wiesel discovered these uh, edge detectors in the visual cortex, a whole new generation of scientists uh, began to study how these um, edge detectors uh, get hooked up during development. People asked the question, well, do you need visual experience? to to produce this wiring, or do uh, is it built in? Is it genetically sort of a part of our equipment? The brain, uh, it's as it develops, it just automatically uh, wires up these edge detectors. What is the role of visual experience? And so uh, lots of uh, early experiments were performed on kittens, uh, 
where they would take kittens and they would do various types of um, procedures to restrict their visual experience. For example, here we see a kitten with uh, goggles on, and the goggles are such that they only see horizontal uh, edges. So it's like black and white horizontal bars, right? And so they, uh, as they develop, for weeks, they wear these goggles. They never, ever see anything except what's in their goggles, which are these, it's like a horizontal grating stimulus. So you get uh, black and white horizontal bars. So then, you know, they wait for the cat's uh, cat to develop, and then they want to, as an adult, record from cells in the visual cortex. And so the question was, well, uh, are they going to have uh, horizontal line detectors? Are they going to have uh, uh, vertical edge detectors in their visual cortex, right? Or will there be a, a change in the relative numbers of those cells as a result of the visual experience? And so sure enough, when they uh, recorded from visual cortex looking for cells with the different orientations, I'll move this out of the way here, they found far fewer vertical edge detecting cells. Right, and so the idea is that this restricted visual experience here changed the wiring of the visual cortex. There were many more horizontal edge detectors as a consequence of uh, seeing horizontal lines for the period of development, but very few uh, vertical edge detecting cells. So visual experience clearly played a role in the wiring of the visual cortex. Furthermore, not only did they detect a significant deficit in the number of vertical edge detecting cells, but the animals showed behavioral deficits. So they would run around their environment, but they would run into the, the legs of tables and chairs, right? So they seem to have difficulty perceiving vertical edges. And so this is a nice example of how a, a perceptual deficit uh, can be understood in terms of the biology of their brain. They have far fewer cells that are tuned to uh, detect vertical edges, and as a consequence, they can't perceive vertical edges as well as normal cats, and they would run around and bump into um, tables and chairs. So, in summary then, we attempted to explain or understand the presence of edge detecting cells in the visual cortex discovered famously a few decades ago by first referring to the fact that there is a one-to-one -one sort of spatial mapping between the retina and the visual cortex such that the pattern of wiring between the two uh, areas uh, can uh, set up the possibility for cells that respond to certain preferred stimuli. Uh, and then we um, reminded ourselves that uh, uh, target cells will respond maximally when all three of, it of their inputs are currently simultaneously active. And that set up a, a possibility where if the cells that uh, are the inputs to the target cell, if they are being activated by a certain type of stimulation on the retina, then the target cell's activity then will come to represent that preferred stimulus on the retina. So again, the idea of the mapping between the retina and the visual cortex and this idea of spatial summation helps us understand how we can have cells in the visual cortex that respond to certain preferred edges at certain preferred orientations.